find our text in the book of Psalms. Book of Psalms. It's a joy to be back here again. I think it's been 10 years since I was here before. I was amazed that several of you come up and told me you remember what I preached. I don't even remember what I had for breakfast. <laughs> I do thank the Lord for the privilege to be here. It is in my heart in these service this morning and then again tonight to look at two of the six wilderness psalms in the scriptures. Time when the psalmist found himself in a wilderness. Uh, we're in a wilderness as a nation. It is a time of unknown. It is a time of insecurity. It is often accompanied with darkness. It is often a narrow place. It is often accompanied with pain and heartache and sorrow. You may be going through it yourself or you may be accompanying someone else through a wilderness. I have found in the study of these six wilderness psalms that God would use trouble as a leverage to move you from a low place to a high place. He always uses them to his advantage to move you closer to himself. So these two of the six I'd like to look at today, I'd like to preach on this subject. It's very elementary. After being in Sunday school, I feel like I'm the kindergarten teacher that has come. But I want to preach on this subject. My Lord knows the way through the wilderness. He has no bypasses. If you want to bypass your troubles, don't follow God. He refuses to bypass them. All he knows is the way through them. Well, what does he want me to do? He says, all you have to do is follow me. The first one I'd like to look at this morning is in Psalms 3. And I want us to see this morning that he would use this wilderness, in the life of David, as a leverage, as well as in my life and yours, to move us from fetters to freedom. I don't know about you, I'm sure many of you are candidates for wings and already had your halo sized and all of that. I hadn't got that far yet. Most of my troubles bind me up, they tie me up. And I'm praying, you know, Lord, y'all help me, I don't know what I'm going to do. He never intended trouble to do that. He always intended trouble to set you free. Notice how David gets free in this Psalm 3. The Bible said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there which be say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. And he heard me out of his holy temple, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. <coughs> I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessings is upon thy people. Selah. You may be seated. Preacher, could I get some water? Anybody? Get me some? Oh, wonderful. You're so kind. In this psalm this morning, as God would use this wilderness to move him from 
fetters to freedom. I was extremely interested in David's declaration here. I was interested in the title of declaration. Oh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said he believed that the titles was as inspired as the text. I have a tendency to agree with him. Notice the title, if you would. A Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. I write in my Bible, I don't know if you do or not. I don't know if you would be interested in circling the word psalm or not. It is the first time that it appears in the Psalms. It appears here. The little word psalm. You say, why is it so important? Well, it's extremely important. The little word psalm is the little word mizmor in the original language. It means a pruning away of that which is unnecessary. Literally to muse and meditate upon the psalms. God said, I will cut away from your life that which is unnecessary. He said, I shall trim the temporal away and leave the eternal. And so it is with wildernesses. They seem to bring to light that which is important versus that which is unimportant. I notice in the title, it is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom and his son. I would assure you this morning that David was not having a scratchy throat. Oh no. Absalom and Ahithophel have conspired and they have stole David's kingdom from him. He is stealing away with everything. He's a multimillionaire. And he's stealing away with everything he has in a shopping bag. And in the rearview mirror, Absalom is raping all of his wives on the roof of the temple. Uh, he's having more than a bad pain in his lower back. Uh, you and I, we whine about so little. We call it a wilderness. I don't even know that it would qualify as a wilderness in the Bible. But we are dealing with a wilderness situation here. Uh, he is going to use it in David's life to move him from fetters to freedom. I notice not only the title of the declaration, I notice a treasure of declaration. I notice three times that David would insert the little word Selah in this text. It is after verse number two. It is after verse number four. It is after verse number eight. It is a whole note in the song. If a song leader is leading the choir and he wants them to hold the note, he often lifts his hand. Oh, you never find a song leader having them to hold a low note. Usually it is a high crescendo note. If you and I are going to get through our wilderness we will not get through it singing in the bass clef in the minor key. You'll only get through there not by whining, but by hitting the high notes. Amen. Are you listening to me this morning? Lord, I'm reminded of the old Gail that went to see a preacher. And... Uh, Started right out of the gate with that wine. Will you pray for me? I'm going through the dark out of the soul. The old preacher said, well, Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, he didn't think she understood, so she cranked it up a knock. She said, Preacher, you just don't understand. I'm going through the dark out of the soul. He shouted again. He said, I don't understand why you shout. He said, you said you was going through it. 
I say you would just shout her out. He said, if you were in it, I say we'd pray about it. If you're going through it, just get on through it. <laughs> Are you listening to me this morning? Most of us would rather remain in it than we would to follow God through it. Here, the little word Selah also has the meaning of to pause, to stop, and change the focus. Turn your eyes that way instead of this way. This is the awful deep truth. I don't know if you can get this or not. It may be over your head. If you look around, watch Fox News and CNN a lot, you won't do nothing but worry. But if you look up, you won't do anything but worship. I give a flip less what Mr. Obama does. He can do anything he wants to do. God's still one in the end. Bill and Hillary never messed it up. He's never going to mess it up. And the one that's coming after him, man, you'll never mess it up. We still won. You can't beat that. Why should I concern myself about what he's doing? He's going to do a lot of things that's going to really worry you and take a lot of money out of your pocketbook. But it ain't going to tell you nothing up there. I love the hound out of that, don't you? Let's stop right there and have a shout break. <laughs> See, it's all about focus. If there's anything your wilderness will demand if you're going to get through it, you must have a seal of break. You must stop and change your focus. The songwriter didn't say it foolishly when he said this. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will do what? They'll grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I don't know what you're going through this morning, but it'll lose its appeal. It'll lose its power over you when you look to him. I'm talking about David's declarations. But don't beware. I'm not saying that wildernesses are easy. Oh, no. I've had my share of them, and they're not no cakewalk. Could I look at a second thought in verse number one? Notice David's darkness. Oftentimes, wildernesses are accompanied with darkness. And as a fellow myself, I've been afraid of the dark all my life. I always sleep with nightlight on the house. There's a 100-watt bulb burning at my house now. Two Georgia power poles burning on either end of my house. Uh, the, the, lar- the yard's always lit up. I doubt very seriously the birds would light in my yard. I think the sun's shining there all the time. I've always been afraid of the dark. God has purpose in the darkness. Watch the text. He said, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? I want us to notice the great amount in the darkness. I was interested in this little word trouble. It it is a narrow, dark, impassable place is the little word David uses here. A dark, narrow, all those words, I don't like them, narrow, you get scrooched up. Dark, narrow, and then that impassable, you can't get through it by yourself impassable place. I got to thinking about darkness a long time ago, and I don't know. In my upbringing, I always thought that darkness, that was the devil. God, he just deals in light. But I I don't know about you, I've found a study of the Bible mess up a lot of things you thought you believed. Just for a second, could I look at a verse for just a moment about darkness? Isaiah chapter number 45. Because we're in a dark time right now. And I know you think the devil's brought it. Man, man, there's a dark cloud. How in the world can them people vote for that man? There's a dark cloud of devils. Sure enough. Let's look at Isaiah 45 and see where darkness comes from. 45.7. Isaiah 
This is God speaking. I form the light. The little word form is a little word to hand make. And create, ruh ruh, darkness. Wow. The little word create is our little word for steering wheel. He said, I got steering wheel to all darkness. So if there's any darkness come riding into your life, the devil wasn't driving. God said I was. Wow. Look, watch the text. He says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and time out. Hold on. Do what? <laughs> See, it creates evil. Oh, my. Man. He said, I got the steering wheel to all evil. Wow. Man. <laughs> That is a big limb to step out on in my Bible. Man, it sounds like God's in control of everything. Are you listening to me this morning? So why should I concern myself with this darkness? Why shouldn't I turn my eyes towards the one that has brought it? The one with the steering wheel. And, and he says in verse number 7, he said, just in case you think there's some things I can't do. He said, I the Lord do all. I didn't know if you'd see that word or not. <laughs> These things. You said, what in the world would he want to bring darkness into my life for? Look at verse 3. He said, I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of the secret place that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by my, thy name, am the God of Israel. There is some things that you can only learn about God in the dark. You cannot learn them when everything is going well. He must cut the lights out on you and bring you to your wit's end. Then you'll see him clearer than you've ever seen him before. We're back in Psalms 3. You still with me? You had not left me yet, have you? Notice in David's darkness, not only do we see a great amount, but I notice in verse number 2 there is a gracious announcement. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. That is a very helpless statement there to tell someone, hey, but no help for you. No help for you. As David is leaving this arena with Ahithophel and Absalom, crossing the Kidron. There's a man by the name of Shimei who is cussing David as he is leaving. David tells his men to let him cuss on. I can't help but believe that maybe he is telling David, Hey bud, there ain't no help for you in God. That's exactly where he messed up. To tell someone there is no help for you, that is a helpless statement. But when you connect those last two words, business picks up. In God. Because see this morning, if you're in God, they ain't nothing but help everywhere you look. Wow. Man. You say, preacher, I know one thing, I'm in God. Well, if you're in Him this morning and in Christ, you've got all the help you need. Amen. Huh? It shouldn't be tying you all up, it should be setting you free. Oh, I'm glad this morning that I'm in Christ. Did you notice what David did after verse number two? Took him a seal of break. <laughs> Stop! Oh, Shimei, I said, ain't no help for you in God. David, stop. He ain't going to look at Shimei. He's looking at God. 
Wow. Can you see the freedom beginning to take root in David's life? You say, oh, that seems so simple. It is. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Things of this earth will grow strangely dim. The light of his glory and grace. Notice in our text, not only David's declaration, David's darkness. Any of you here this morning, I, I, Lord, I don't want to be nosy. I want to stick my nose in your business. Any of you here this morning in a dark situation? Don't know how it's going to come out. Man, you got a family member in a real pickle. Don't know how it's going to come out. I tell you what, you better quit trying to figure that situation. You better turn to the one that brought it. It's the only one that can lead you through it. No matter, no, no matter of your manipulation and figuring will get you through it. You got to follow him through it. Notice David's dependency. I notice in verse number three, there is the confidence of dependency. David begins to reminisce on who God is. See, most of the time we get in trouble, we begin to reminisce on how we're going to get through it. Maybe if I rob, rob Paul, I can pay Peter. Maybe if I do this, I can do this. Maybe if I do that, I, maybe if I go to that seventh doctor, he can help me. Just on and on and on we go. David doesn't do that. He stops. He begins to muse and meditate upon God. He said, but thou, O Lord. He goes back to that old term for God that first appeared back down there for big for us at Moses' burning bush, the great I am statement. He goes back to that Yahweh statement. The God who always keeps his promises. I don't know about you, I'll not testify for you, but I, I was so thrilled when I met the great I am and I realized that he was not a God of, of the past or the future. He's always a God of right now. <laughs> I was in the 10th grade three times and I kept flunking English was the big thing I didn't have to tell you that you'd already figured that out but uh, <laughs> conjugating verbs and all of that I just never could figure all that stuff out I was glad when I met up with him he doesn't need any conjugation he's just always I am and that's who David turns to and he says, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me. I was interested in that little word shield. It means to be encompanied about with protection. Accompanied about with protection. David said he is a shield for me. I was thinking about moving that Old Testament thought of a shield into the New Testament arena. Paul talks about in the armor of the faith, he talks about a shield. Do you remember it? He said, take up the shield of faith, which is the Word of God. Well, you say, what's the big deal about me having a strong relationship with my Bible? What is the big deal about me getting my kids together every night and reading the Bible to them? David, Paul says this, take the shield of faith that you may be able to quench all, there's that word again, the fiery darts of Satan. The little word quench quench there means to sizzle. Every shot Satan takes at you, if you've got a strong relationship with this book, you'll <laughs> I don't know about you. I'll not testify for you. I know many of you are further along than I am. But I've been letting a bunch get through. I ain't been sizzling them. And Paul clearly told us if we had a strong relationship with this book, we'd sizzle every one of them. Satan could never get a shot through to us. As a nation, 
as a church, there's a bunch of them getting through. Are you listening to me? David has turned back at this very elementary time in his life. Time of darkness. He wants to get free. He's turned back to the elementary. He said, thou art a shield for me. He says in verse number three, he says, my glory. I was interested in that little word glory. It means to lift up in adoration of another. What good is it going to do me to lift up and adore God? This is awful deep. Notice what happens to my chin and my face when I lift up God. Most of us, when are in our troubles, chin down on the ground. You can't do that and lift up God. It just don't work. Wow. You go to lifting up God, you go to lifting up yourself. I don't feel like shouting. Well, shout till you feel like it. I don't feel like waving my hand while they're saying, well, wave it till you feel like it. I guarantee you it'll change your whole aroma. Are you listening to me this morning? He says he is the lifter up of my hand. Head. Oh, how many times have I come into a service lower than snail snot? And somebody will just sing a chorus of her song and I'll Amen. feel the good Holy Ghost yeah. do this. Yeah. 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 Lift her up of my head. Yeah. Talking about getting free in your troubles. Huh? I'm not talking about coming over here on Wednesday. Y'all pray for me, preacher. I'm really going through it. I don't know how we're going to get through this. <laughs> I know how you'll get through it. Follow him. He's the only one that knows the way through it. I don't know the way through your troubles. I don't even know where he's going. Look at another thought. Not only the confidence of dependency. Notice the cry of dependency in verse 4. He said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. I was interested there in verse 3, too, with that little word, oh. Oh. It's always a word of desperation. I don't know about you. I'm not, I'm not saying this for you. But I'm finding more and more in my own life that God very seldom ever answers a prayer that doesn't have an O oh in it. And I'm desperate. Oh. God. Matthew Henry said the only prayers God will ever answer is prayers that are framed in the will of God. I think a lot of our prayers, we just do the picture. <laughs> We're very seldom concerned with the will of God. The will of God will bring you into desperation. I remember some time ago when they told me Told us that our daughter-in-law, they thought she had real bad cancer, and she did. <laughs> I thought she was going to die and leave us with four kids. We got desperate. Oh, Lord, business picked up. We rung heaven's bell. God's healed her, brought her through it. You listening to me? I have never had an O put in a prayer by God that I didn't have the sense of assurance he had heard me. John said, if he hurries you, you got it. Huh? I love that. David has gotten desperate. There is a cry of dependency. There is a cry of desperation. Can I mention this last thought and I'm done? Notice David's deliverance. Notice in verses 5 and 6, the rest, the rest, R-E-S-T of deliverance. I laid me down. Did what? Ain't nobody lays down and sleeps when they're having trouble. That's when you pace the floor. That's when you count sheep. That's when you talk about, I got insomnia, I just can't sleep. David saw and logs. I can't help but believe that David is beginning to get free. He is not bound up with fetters. 
He said, I laid me down and slept. I wait for the Lord sustained me. Oh, David said, when I laid down, I was encamped about with a number of Absalom's enemy soldiers. And he said, when I awoke, I was all right. Because of something David had done? Oh, no, 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 no. It's because of what God had done. I don't know about you. I'm fast coming to the conclusion. God says he never sleeps or slumbers. You remember reading that? Now, if he's going to stay up, there is no need of us both staying up. Do you think? I mean, if you want to stay up and worry about it, he ain't going to stop you. If you just want to give it to him, go to bed. It's in good hands. The rest of deliverance. I notice in verses 7 and 8, there is the restorer of deliverance. He says in verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me. I thought this was interesting. It's a powerful little statement. David was a believer that if he could get God to stand up, all of his troubles were over. Do you know that our Lord, when he ascended back to heaven, he's been set down now for over 2,000 years. The only time he ever got up was for Stephen's homecoming. That's the only thing that's ever gotten. Bill and Hillary's never gotten him up. <laughs> Obama, abortion, all the homosexuals coming out of the closet, he ain't stood up yet. Well, what in the world do we want him to stand up for? Well, if he stands up, all of mine, your problems are over. When he stands up, he's coming. I love that, don't you? Almost make you want to go to the house this afternoon and say, Lord, stand up. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see? David said he said he broke the jaws and all the teeth fell out of the mouth. Wow. Wouldn't that be something to see all them people in Washington, all the teeth falling out of the mouth? <laughs> all he did is stand up. He makes this statement in verse number 8. He said, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation is not of man. Salvation is not of man's manipulations. Salvation is of God. Deliverance comes from Him. I was thinking this morning and Fetters to freedom. I was thinking about the <coughs> three Hebrew boys. Old Nebuchadnezzar throwed them in the fire. You remember what he did before he threw them in the fire? The Bible said he tied them up. You remember the only thing they lost in the fire? They didn't lose nothing in the fire but the ties. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, how in the world did they lose them? Ties. The Bible said he threw them down in the fire. They're not looking for exit. Nebuchadnezzar's up there. He's doing a head count. He said, don't we, throw, don't we throw three in there? He said, yeah. He said, that's four in there, okay. He said, then one of them in there like the Son of God. And I didn't even know God had a son. He's looking in there. Well, them boys are in the fire. They down low. They ain't doing no head count. They doing foot count. <laughs> ain't they supposed to be six feet in here? They is eight feet in here. <laughs> and them feet over there look like they're bronzed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like they've been in the fire. Wow. And where they get to see that? Well, they had to get down low. You know, Peter and John, when they come to the tomb, old Peter didn't hardly see nothing in that tomb because he busted on in there. Old John got down low. He stooped, the Bible said. And they saw all them garments laid there. It looked like he had floated out of them. But Mary, she came along. She, she got lower than the both of them. She saw two angels in there. Peter and John never said anything about seeing no angels in there. She said she saw two angels in there, one at the foot, one at the head. They was talking. She come on out and she saw him. 
the lower you get in your wilderness, the more you'll get to see and the more he will set you free. I was thinking some time ago, a young girl there in our community, I had pastored her for a number of years when she was a little girl. And uh, I remember she made a profession there at the church. Of course, you know, after they grow up, you don't know what they've done. And uh, she got married, had a couple of boys. And I heard that a husband, he had had a, a order replaced in his heart when he was 15. They told him it would be fine. And several months ago, he came home on Thursday night and told her he was going to take a shower. And she felt like he had been in there too long. She went in there to check on him. And that aorta had come loose. and He had emptied all of his blood out on the bathroom floor. That's the way she found him. He had gone. He dead. Left her with two little boys. And uh, I was just wondering if that little old Profession she had made, Mike there was going to take her through that. I looked up on Facebook. She has a had a little boutique down in our town in Athens, down close to the University of Georgia. I noticed in the boutique behind the cash register on the wall, big bold letters. The words out of Jeremiah, I know the thoughts I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring about an expected end in your life. Well, my wife and I went to the funeral home. Thank the Lord I didn't let her, let me talk her out of it. She told me I needed to stay there. I waited an hour and a half sitting there to see her. And there was another hour and a half behind me to see her. And the only reason I wanted to see her, I wanted to see if that little profession was going to cause her to have fetters of freedom. Well, I got up there to her, and I put my arm around her, and I pulled up to me, and I said, Tiffany, I said, the only way you're going to get through this is to turn to that verse you got on the wall in your boutique. This big smile comes on her face from ear to ear. <laughs> Amen. And she begins to weep. And she said, Preacher, she said, Thursday night when this happened, she said, I told my daddy, I said, Daddy, I cannot go to the funeral home. I'm too much of a mess. She said, All day Friday, she said, I was in a mess. I can't go to that funeral home Sunday. She said, About midnight. She said, I called my daddy on Friday night. She said, Daddy, I don't know what's happened to me. She said, I don't know if God's prayers of his people have gotten through or not. She said, but I got the peace that passeth all understanding. And I'm already done. I said, wow, that little old profession she made back there will, will give her freedom instead of fetters in a wilderness situation. Would you stand with us this morning? Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your sweet day. <laughs> While our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. While we wait in his presence, I don't know what your needs are this morning. Maybe you're going through a wilderness. <laughs> Maybe you want to bow in his presence. Just ask him to let you see the way through to follow him. Maybe some of these folks come around and play us a little something on the instrument. We'll just wait. May want to join the brother here and just shout your way through. Not anything wrong with that. God's speaking to you. Oh, preacher, you don't know what I'm in the middle of. No, I don't. But he does. If it's binding you up, it's not his purpose. It's his purpose to free you. Maybe you need to get down low this morning in the middle of it. While we wait. 
while they play us a little something. Altars open. Maybe you're here this morning, you're lost in the wilderness of sin without hope and without God. Why don't you turn your eyes to a Savior that can save. He's mighty to save. While we wait, you come, you come, you come. Page 370 in your All-American. <laughs> Yeah. 